I'm over here.
They are caught in the will of unawareness. They are hooked because of so many facets of our life that we can all relate to. So the first thing I want us to start out with, uh, so why is it, how is it, how do we answer the question, how compelling is her, is her story and why does it hook us? Then me, and I'll tell that as part of this, this, uh, this talk as well. Uh, and give some context, so it's part of my personal, both academic and other journey as a public citizen, as a citizen of the Palo Alto area, the Stanford community, that I got involved It's not only just because I was a historian. Um, so, and then I, 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 so I want to play with that question that will get us at, as you see the exhibition Uh, as you as you uh, see the, the different parts that we put together for this exhibition, first thing you may say, there are fragments of our life. And that's what we had to deal with. We had to put together a variety of artifacts and other fragments, uh, testimonies, uh, 19th century texts, um, a wall that are the composites of our process of historical recovery. So we don't have the full narrative. I can't tell you, no one can tell you the full narrative of what our real is like. And yet, I go back to that question. If we only had fragmentary evidence of her life in the 19th century, why is it so compelling? So let me, let me get on with that question. One was because there were a group of women who were advocating for the representation of women in local history. Jean McDonald, a number of other, other folks uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, the Women's Heritage Museum, eventually what became the Women's Heritage Museum. And as far as I can tell, looking at some of the documents, it goes back initially to 1989 when they were saying what? The city of San Francisco does not have a historical marker dedicated to a woman. Remarkable, 1989. The state of California only has one of a Latina. Right? Late 20th century. Something's wrong here. So you had political advocacy, women's rights, and others joined in. The Bay <coughs> Network of Latinas joined in. So Latinas were joined in this chorus of other people who were now going to the parks and recreation commission to the board of supervisors to the state agencies and saying uh, there needs to be representation and we have someone who should be represented it took years until 1998 before that historical marker and how many of you been over to washington square and have seen that marker? Right? walk by there and i want you the next time after going through this exhibition just let your imagination run wild. That was Juana Briones' little piece of land. And of course, you know, she's been discovered, right? When a journalist for the Chronicle says, now Juana Briones is the first mother of San Francisco. We know about it, right? We know about it. But that political advocacy was really important. It was about historical figures that had been thrown into the historical dustbin. And people were saying, we want women, and we want Latinas, and we want this representation. Yet we still didn't know much about Juana Briones at that time. Um, the educational value of the story of Juana Briones. That's one of the first things that attracted me, and I'll tell you the background of that in a few minutes. The Juana Briones Heritage Foundation, which starts, starts up, it too is arguing and advocating for something else, not for a plaque in Washington Square, for the preservation of her rancho home in the hills of Palo Alto. That was facing demolition. The house, as you'll see from the exhibition over here, um, badly damaged. Uh, it had been the longest continuously lived in structure in Santa Clara County history. And it was damaged, no longer um, could one reside in it. Changed ownership. And the people said, we want to build a big house on that hill. Beautiful hill. 
this lake would be, we understand, a lot sold for two and a half million. So on a new property, she, she knew what to pick out in Palo Alto. Uh, it was a gorgeous, and you'll see, you'll see the photograph over here, panoramic view of the Bay Area. So I knew how to pick out uh, property, not only here, but in Yerba Buena, the origins of the San Francisco community. But when I learned from the, the Heritage Foundation that previously, the owners, before the earthquake, were allowing children School children from the local Palo Alto schools, and there's a school, an elementary school named after one of them, one of the families. They would come in, and the docents, all volunteers, would talk to the children about this woman as much as they knew, about her life in this period of time, and these children were captivated. I remember, as I got involved with the Heritage Foundation, reading some of the letters of the children, now college age, that had written as grammar school children about their experience going into the water breeder's house. And it was wonderful. It was touching. That was a compelling reason that brought a lot of people, including this educator, into the context of the Heritage Foundation and a number of other people, dozens and then hundreds in the Palo Alto area because they saw the educational value of her life and the preservation of that home. In fact, I usually don't quote myself, but I will here. Um, <laughs> I look back at the Heritage Foundation website, and there I am, I'm among others. Uh, and if you click on my face, I didn't even remember this, but you click on my face, and here's what I had to say, uh, apropos of what I just said. Whoa. I didn't say that. <laughs> we must step up the challenge and save this house for California's children. They deserve to know the rich and diverse history of our state. Saving the Briones House is about saving a critical part of our collective past. So, how, whatever other quotes I gave, this is the one that is posted on our website. Because I, I truly believe that. There was an opportunity at that point, had we saved that structure, all that went around that wall, it would have been a wonderful place to educate the next generation of our children about part of California history they simply don't care about. And importantly, a woman figure, an important woman figure of the 19th century and a Latina figure of the 19th century. What else was compelling? Now if you think about Juan Briones, pretty amazing character. She was able to navigate effectively in a multiracial society. She herself was multiracial, Afro-Latina, mestiza, as was so many of the settlers that came from the heart of Mexico, the north of Mexico, to settle in uh, Alta California. But more importantly, she was able to interact. We call it interracial um, interaction today. But back then, she navigated uh, multiracial, multinational populations. How? I don't know. She didn't speak anything other than Spanish, as we understand it. And yet, just to give an example, there's a portrait of a fellow over here. I won't give it away. Go to this part of the room. He jumped ships, jumped ship, a uh, clipper ship to bay. Because, like a lot of young men, they join uh, in, on the East Coast these clipper ships that are coming around the horn. It's a difficult life. They don't realize this when they're signing on. And when they come to San Francisco, I'm getting out of here. Uh, they jump ship. You do not want to be caught by the captain or the crew because you're going to be lashed. You're going to be punished. So they come to this foreign land with Spanish-speaking people here. This is the 30s, 1830s. And they don't know what to do. How did he find out that the person he should go seek refuge is one of realness? Already, by this time, someone told this young sailor, an American man, young man, go seek out this Spanish-speaking woman over here uh, near the Presidio, and she, he and a Philippine sailor and a Native American sailor, multiracial, they discover one. I would have loved to have heard that conversation. You know, um, were they hand gesturing? What? <laughs> 
makes me believe that one I probably do a little bit of it. <laughs> what does she do? She hides it. She knows these young men are facing great risk. She says, somehow she puts it in the attic, and then the ship goes off, sails off. And then she calls her brother, he comes over in a rowboat, and takes them off to these things. Think about the humanitarian character of this. So they already knew that she had a reputation. She had a reputation as a healer, and I suspect that's where it came from. Because curanderas, folk healers in the 19th century, were more than just medicinal people that played with medicines, concocted potions to make you feel better. They were humanitarians. They reached, they were the doctors of the frontier. They cared for people. She already had that reputation in the 1830s when people were seeking her out. Partly because she was a very wise businesswoman. Her little ranch in Yoba Bueno was flourishing. And the captains knew about her the, the, because she was providing them with fresh eggs and um, other vegetables and probably beef and goats and to provision the ships. So they knew about her. She already had a multi-dimensional identity to people who were coming in on these clipper ships. That's pretty amazing. I can't think of any other 19th century figure that had this ability to move across groups, national origin groups, irrespective of language, irrespective of religion, irrespective of culture. She did it. That's amazing. That was a hope for a lot of people. She what an amazing person. How could she navigate that and yet maintain a ranch successfully? A humanitarian? A folk healer? Lots of books here. Another one. So, Think about now the story I'm building of the character of this person. How many women, Mexican and Spanish women of the era, because there are only 33, by the way, in the state of California, that had legal claim to their land as women? She was one of the few. One of the few, four decades later, that still held on her land. She was persistent and something that certainly resonates with me, and I think resonates with all of us. She was a staunch defender of her rights. The rights as a mother with an abusive husband. You'll read, you'll read the documents that she recorded. Someone else wrote them, penned them, but it was her voice. And she talked about and complained about an abusive alcoholic husband. She was maintaining the family. She was the breadwinner. She complained to the civil authorities. She complained to the ecclesiastical authorities. She wanted a divorce. She leaves the presidio home where her husband, as a retired soldier, had a small plot of land. And she starts a life with her children, all of her young children, in Yerba Buena, right? in the cove of Yerba Buena, in order to San Francisco. More miraculously than that. So, if you, if you know something about 19th century California, it was really hard if you were a Spanish-speaking landowner to maintain title to your land. Though the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo guaranteed all Mexican and Spanish landowners title to their land as American citizens, as they become American citizens, if they stay in the region, the uh, nature of the treaty provides those rights. The U.S. Senate decides no, with, the, with, the, with the, really the nudging of California Senator Quinn at the time. No, they should really be able to uh, have to claim in a court, in an American court of law, in English, the rights to their land. They have to define that they have really the right to that land and with the, document, the legal documents that prove that. Not an easy thing to do for 19th century California ranch owners and farm owners or even owners of small plots of land. Because the diseño, the 19th century Spanish-Mexican document that defined your plot of land was, oh, the no está allá, the hill is over there, el río allá, the river over here, uh, y la bahía, bahía, en este lado, la bay. So it was descriptive. The maps are pretty, pretty uh, basic. And that's all you had to go into a court of law 
complained that that was your land. A lot of people lost their lands. Even more lost their lands um, by virtue of having to hire an English-speaking attorney without much cash. What did you do? You paid them off with land. By the 1870s, the vast majority, 350 million acres of land were lost. Part of the land tenure change in California. Did water builders lose their land? Hell no. <laughs> Here's the persistence and the defender of her rights. And so she's, a, she's an incredible model. I'm astounded every time I think about this. She hires an attorney, an English-speaking attorney, it turns out later to be in the second half of the night very prominent attorney. So she wisely picked him. She, yes, she had to pay him, well, we don't know how much money, and, and eventually she sold part of her rancho in Palo Alto, but she held on to it. And through the attorney with her, she not only fights in the, in the district court for her little plot of land near the Presidio, because at the time of uh, Americanization of California, the federal government come in, could come in and say any land that was technically once Spanish, part of the Spanish and Mexican public domain, is now the United States domain. Therefore, the Presidio comes lock, stock, and barrel to the United States federal government. And they said, oh, by the way, Mrs. Leone, there's a little lot there that you're claiming in yours. No, that's the Presidio. She says, uh uh, that's my family land. years later, she wins. <laughs> That's remarkable. It must have taken a toll, but she had to be persistent, and she had to fight for her rights. She fought them uh, as a wife, as a mother, uh, for the protection of her children, and it translated to that persistence and the, being a defender of the rights for her property. So another thing that legal legal folks, when they hear this, oh my goodness, this woman in 19th century should speak English, and she got this amazing attorney and she won the Supreme Court, another book, right? That, that's, oh God, start building up. Think of all these compelling books now. There are others, too. I won't stop. Fight the good fight. That was part of the defense. Fight the good fight. And she fought the good fight. Protection of her land. The uh, oversight of her children, uh, the fact that she could own property herself, that translated to a lot of people. That inspired the Heritage Foundation. Um, fight the good fight. Try to preserve that house. We did win that fight, but we were winning the battle. We didn't win that battle, we're winning the war. But that was inspirational. And then, a last thing, so what am I suggesting here? There are many things about her life as you walk around the segment. You, can, you yourself can make a connection with it, a personal connection, and that draws you in. Let me tell you about something else. The last one you can tell. The house lights, could someone dim those for me? So I want to get you in the mood here. <laughs> someone would dim the lights. Thank you, Jason. Great, thank you. And by the way, turn around. I want you to see this woman. Raise your hand, Marie. She deserves unbelievable uh, kudos for the amount of research that this CHS employee archivist did to help put, and really hugely put all the things before you. She was just a remarkable team member of the Water Briones team. Let's give her a round of applause. very closely with one of my students from Stanford who graduated last June, who did an honors thesis on water realness and actually a, 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 an honors thesis that envisioned the galleries that you see and many of the uh, texts and the artifacts that you see in this exhibition actually comes out of the honors thesis of Maritza Urquiza, um, who now is in the state capital as a capital fellow. But this was a team, uh, team process that was done to come back then. All right, so we're going to can we dim these lights a little bit? So we here, all right. So I want you to think with me now. I'm going to tell you a little story. It's got to be a little dark. 
Okay, if you go over to this corner, you'll see a video. And I'm in that video. So in 2007, at that particular moment in time, we had lost the battle to preserve the home. And the demolition um, permit was issued to the owners. So I asked Chris Samuelson, my friend, colleague in the film studies program at Stanford, Chris, would you, would you come with me to the water videos? I want to capture, we've never had a video of the structure. And I'd like for posterity to have a video. Absolutely, let's go over there. It's the first time I've ever been in a video. And this was the first time that I had been into the home. Owners never allowed us to come in. Never set foot on the property. One special moment to go in. So Chris and I going in. And I'm narrating. I'm going in. Chris has you know, her video with a big light. She's captivated by it too. And we're moving from the living room into what was the cocina? The kitchen. The hearth. And then Chris, something catches Chris's attention. She goes with her light and her camera over to the other room. All right. Sight. And over, I, I can see it. It's close to the wall. And I'm looking at it. And, I, and my imagination starts carrying me. I can imagine her there. Mesa. Siéntate, mijo. Tienes hambre. Sit down. What? Are you hungry? Uh, then I felt it. I felt it. I feel something was drawing me in. I felt something in the walls of that structure, especially in the cocina. Lights back up, please. That, that's the dramatic part. <laughs> that's the dramatic part. So I'm not a type, you know, I don't go and hug trees. I, you know, I'm not a fuzzy kind of guy. Um, I felt something. But maybe because I was getting so close to the topic of her life, right, and now into the home, uh-uh, there's something else operating here, folks. <laughs> if there's any of you that have the crystal ball, so uh, Marie will, will know this, and, and Anthony and the staff know this. So the Eatons buy this house in 1924 from Professor Knott, who bought it from Juan Brion's daughter in 1900. And they own it all the way to the earthquake. And this is said that the daughter of the Eatons grew up there. And she was telling us the story about yeah, they were a, a kind of a theatrical group. They were a literary group. They, they had a lot of barrier folks, some really famous folks, too, would come into this house. And then I saw in this email something that simply attracted my attention and reconnect, reconnected me to that moment that I felt. She said, whenever we brought friends in, in our, and, and we'd sit around the table, everyone said they felt it. Isn't that weird? They felt something. There is a spirit in this wall. And there was a spirit in that home. So those of you toward, inclined towards the mystical, there's another book. Uh, don't quote me because my academic reputation will be soiled. <laughs> but there's something to it, right? Look, she was at the Renera. You had to have special powers to be a really well-respected. And it was more than simply putting those things, medicinal things together. You had something about you that helped to cure people. Who knows? I, one of them, uh, this is the sides. I can't, of course, provide you any evidence. Was Juan Abrios the first dispenser of medicinal marijuana? <laughs> 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 what? Get her all wet out! Yeah. You know, she used to go to Telegraph the Hill and, and pick out the herbs. What was she growing? Why did the sailors come to her? Uh, <laughs> right, strike that from the record. Um, okay, my personal connection. Uh, partly goes back to all these hooks. I, all of them hooked me as I, not initially, but on the second try, fell into the web of water beers. The, the, 
The person who's leading what will eventually become the Heritage Foundation is a fifth grade teacher at where? Juana Briona School, Halima Van Teel. And she's putting together a group of people to see if there's any possibility to save the home from demolition. And I told Halima, Halima, you know, I'm really busy. I've got a graduate student that you should talk with. Um, and she called the graduate students and said, don't go back and talk about it. Uh, but, so she left me alone for a while. And then Jean McDonald and the Women's Heritage uh, Museum folks and the Barry Latino Network folks are mounting now this successful campaign to get the plaque put in Washington Square. And they asked me would I say something about the historical context of Juan Briones. And they sent me some documents, many of which in, in, in Jean McDonald's book some of which we have here. And I started reading these, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, and I said, yes, I will. I will go and talk a little bit about the era in which one of them is another book for me. And not too long, I think it was a conspiracy, because very soon thereafter, Halima Van Teel comes back to my office, Al, oh, would you participate in the Juan Briones uh, restoration project? Absolutely! Um, and that hooked me further. That was important because at that point I knew that there was something of real substance about this woman that had a story had to be told. It was too valuable a story. Children were talking about her right when they came. Uh, people in San Francisco were advocating for her to put a plaque in Washington Square. There were now more and more people, lawyers, joining the group to what? Pro bono defense of restoration of the home. The group was growing by the dozens, by the hundreds. Her family members come to us. They're scattered all over. Bay Area, I found out there's another branch of the family in Oregon when we, when we had the opening, in Texas. And they now are coming to the events that we're staging. We weren't gonna win that battle. We weren't gonna see that. It would've cost five to seven million dollars in the end, had we been able to raise that amount of money, um, it, it was an uphill battle. And we lost that battle. After a protracted 13 years, we lost that battle. But we saved a portion. And there's another portion of this wall. And if there's someone who really has deep pockets out there, or you know someone, the wall, the entire structure is disassembled. In the right place, in the right all the resources it can be reconstructed piecemeal. We didn't throw that stuff away. It's sitting there. You can write a check after this. <laughs> <laughs> so lastly, for me, as a historian, and I'll, this is just this will be a brief story, but it's, it's, it comes full circle for me. So when I started UCLA as a freshman in a long time ago, 1966, um, and I graduated in 1970. And I was among the first handful of students who then go to graduate school to study what? Mexican Americans. It had been a story no one had ever told before. And when I was a freshman, you couldn't have, there were no more than maybe three or four books in the United States that talked about the history of Mexican Americans. And it became my intellectual passion to write that wrong. And after 38 year career at Stanford University, after leaving uh, UCLA, coming to this great private university down in the peninsula, and training people like Chris Ariola, who's one of my students from quite a few years ago, Chris, I'm trying to get 25 years. Um, I felt compelled to get another book, to not just write a book that undergraduates will read maybe a few thousand, maybe 10,000, but the public needs to know about figures like this. And so for me, it meant moving out of the confines of the university's walls and classrooms and contributing to a team effort which was beautifully orchestrated by the staff of CHA, the CHS, Anthea, and Marie, and Shell, and a whole team of people that put this exhibition together. And you heard Anthony say the first bilingual exhibition ever in the history of the California Historical Society, the 
first about a Latina figure. Um, this is unprecedented. Right? And I'm hoping that out of this context tonight, and you're walking around the, the different rooms and seeing the artifacts and the paintings and the portraits and the videos, and you two will be hooked. Invite more people to come. We want young people. We're going to bring lots of young people here. They, they need to know this story and the context in which the life of Juana really is unfolding. So thank you folks for being so attentive, and um, I'm glad to take a, a few questions uh, if, you, if you have some. series of California history in the 19th century that it has a lot of interviews with Spanish-speaking people. They were the elite, they were the, uh, the Vallejos and the Espinosas and the Dominguez's and others. These were the large ranch-owning elite of California with political power. Juana Rios was not that. She was really a working class per person with no political power. So she is lost in that, in that possible recovery. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had, we, we lamented the fact that, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had the, the uh, Thomas Savage transcript? He was one of the people that did the transcriptions and the interviews for Bancroft, Hubert Howard Bancroft. Uh, if we had that document, we don't have that document, therefore we have fragmentary evidence of her life. She's, she's mentioned in one footnote in the Bancroft series. And there's no one that's really else paid attention to her. Um, so she's not in any of the books. But I can tell you that's going to change. Yeah. Uh, they will no longer be able to ignore the history of this, this person. Uh, so you will see the next series of textbooks published um, will have one of those front and center. The microphone is coming around if we have questions. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, what terrible, terrible uh, feelings about uh, the guy who was the owner of the home who, had, who fought and fought to have it uh, demolished uh, after seeing the exhibit. Listen to you. Uh, do you have any comments on the public record about him, his motivations, your feelings about it? So the question about the owner. So is, is he the bad guy? You know, I, I don't want to put a value judgment on him. Um, look, he was a homeowner. He felt that he had a right to that property which he purchased with the intent of, of building his dream home, a big mansion. Uh, so from that perspective, you can appreciate it. But wouldn't you wish that he would have said, we understand your concern about preserving um, this historic structure. Can we work with you? It wasn't that kind of relationship, unfortunately. Um, even worse, it, it, I lament this. Um, that area of her lot, an acre and a half remaining of, of the 4,400-acre ground show, would have been an unbelievable archaeological dig. Mm -hmm. We know things were there. Some of them are unearthed. You'll see a couple in this, I forget where it is. The Metate, where, where, where's the Metate? I forget, it's... The gallery, the, in the gallery, it's Okay, so up here in the, the front part of the gallery. So the, the, the daughter of the owners, uh, the Eatons, uh, found this somewhere. She unearthed it. And, and, and I talked to Barbara Voss, who's our, our uh, expert archaeologist at Stanford, who, by the way, did the El Polin Springs archaeological dig of the Briones original home site in the Presidio, she was just distraught that we, the owners never allowed us the opportunity to go do that dig. Now it's been bulldozed. It's flat. Nothing there. Yes, in the back. Yeah, uh, Halleck. 
<laughs> what is it? Uh, Henry Halleck, I think it was. And yeah, he becomes quite an, quite an interesting and well-known attorney um, in the second half of the, of the 19th century in California. So uh, I would love to know why he decided to defend Juan Am. And like so many attorneys at that time, just to give you a, 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 a context, in Southern California, what we call the period of the land grab, every third American man was an attorney. <laughs> I, I looked it up in the census. In the 1860s and 1870s, the land grab of Southern California happened here much quicker. Every third man was an attorney. And many of them ended up becoming landowners because that land was turned over instead of cash. Right? But he like, didn't do that. I like to, I bet that man had a lot of integrity. And I bet that he realized the integrity of the woman for whom he was working for. Uh, can never document that, but I would not be surprised if that would happen between the relationship of the attorney to his client. Uh, any other, yes? Hi, um, I was with Maria when she was born. Uh, and I was wondering what you thought about the fact that she was there preparing for the and they were looking through birth and death records, and I heard a lot of stories about uh, Juana being a midwife who had baptized uh, children and who I, I think were near death. I was just hoping you mentioned spirit, if you could talk a little bit about um, her faith and what motivated perhaps her humanitarian stream, or she's clearly connected to the mission. Big time connected to the mission. So, another book. Thank you, Christina, for raising that question. If you're a devout Catholic, this woman was a saint. <laughs> she really is. Because she herself was incredibly devout. She baptized over 25 children in the years that she was here in, um, at Santa Clara. Um, she gave last rites. So uh, parteras, uh, midwives, could, could give last rites to a dying child. And think about it, the frontier. You are as likely to die at birth um, than live for you know, through a childhood uh, because of the conditions, and the problems of a child giving birth to children on the frontier. A really, very difficult situation. So, deeply connected to the mission here in San Francisco, and when she moved to Palo Alto, also deeply committed to the Santa Clara mission. Uh, there's a document in our collection here where she takes it upon herself to write, someone's obviously writing for her, uh, about the canonization of a priest whom she knew about. Um, so the Catholicism obviously ran deep in Juana Briones, obviously must have informed her the way she was a humanitarian and she cared for people. So that religious cultural connection um, was obviously a huge part of this woman's life on the frontier. Um, and yet, yet another compelling book. So um, if, if the religious part of it is, is the religious mystical connection, well, I'm not sure. I'm not a very good Catholic, I would be the one to say. Uh, so, uh, but, but yes, there was obviously, and the record does tell us, a deep abiding affection and connection to Catholicism and the institution of <coughs> the church in the Bay Area and all the California. Here comes a little, well, whoever wants to have a microphone. Yes, sir. Um, and we'll have that here. Is there some particular connection uh, that she has in the East Bay for the, for the reservoirs made for her? How did that come? Well, you know what happened? That's the family connection. So she has a brother that goes to Bolinas. Right, so Point Reyes, and she has a nephew that actually becomes a doctor there, and he claims, we have the, the document, that he claims that he learned a lot from his tia, his aunt. Right, so she was uh, obviously, pat that's the way uh, Urandarismo uh, was, pat was passed on generation to generation, women in particular, but not exclusively, because she passed on whatever knowledge she had to this nephew. And he lived as well in the East Bay. And so there in the Bolinas Museum, 
there are a number of artifacts uh, from the other part of the family that moved across the bay. In fact, the big chest, that bit of, big beautiful chest, it was, uh, was borrowed from the Bolinas Museum. They, they actually were very cooperative, as was uh, the Bancroft Library of Stanford University, a number of other places that you'll see the, the, the compilation of these things was really a, a, I think Anthony referred to it, it takes a village to do these things, absolutely. Yes, you had a question. Yeah, I can project. Okay. Um, so I haven't had a chance to uh, do any, I really don't want to <laughs> uh, Only take a, just a quick span of the exhibit, but do you happen to know if she hired anybody else to help her secure her lands? So, so the question, oh, sorry. So the question was, do, do we have any, any evidence of her hiring anyone else besides Helic uh, with the uh, the legal side of the specifically a cartographer. Would she have been clever enough to realize maybe she should get some American-made maps? Well, yes, there there were there were um, land surveyors that came in because under the under the law. So remember, I said it had uh, Mexican Spanish landowners had to in in the context of American law and land law had to have it surveyed. So yes, there are surveyors. Um, uh, maps of her land and one that actually in the end um, she invited to stay overnight because there was no one else nearby that he could stay with and as he talks about this very um, cordial I forget the terminology used uh, this woman who invited me in and commentary about humanitarianism who's she taking care of a sick man an older man we think it's actually the sailor that had jumped ship in the 30s, who she became a lifelong friend, and a sick Indian girl. So she was bringing people into her house in Palo Alto to take care of her. Uh, but yes, we do have a surveyor's map, and we do have some of those somewhere around here, I forget where. But uh, yes, but they weren't legal. They weren't legal experts or legal, legal help. They were to define the boundaries, the official boundaries of the, of the land grant. Yes, ma'am. Did she, did she act? Thank you. Did she actually go to court? Did, and what court did she go to? That's a good question. Did she actually go to court? Now here's where you have to have your imagination run wild. We have no evidence that she ever went to court herself. I cannot believe that this woman, defender of her rights, who will write to the ecclesiastical and civil authorities uh, asking to be divorced from her husband, would not go to court to defend her land, I bet any money she went to court. Uh, I know she didn't go to the Supreme Court. Uh, I don't think they would have taken six months to, to go uh, in, in those days. But uh, I have I have every belief that she accompanied Kelly. But Marie, we never found any evidence whatsoever that she did that. And the court records we have are the legal records of the decision. Um, they don't, unlike today, have descriptions of who came to court. But that's a good question. But I, 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 I cannot imagine she didn't go to those courts. So I'm curious about the family now. You talked about the branches of the family. Right? What do they think now? Or what, what do you think? What, what do you think of them? Or what do they think of this? <laughs> so, so Tom, did you all hear that question about the family? And the family's growing too. They're coming out of the woodworks. You may be if you know this family. So there was a really touching moment here at the, at the opening of the exhibition a few weeks ago. My wife and I come in and these people surround us right away. They say, oh, you're Professor Camarillo. Thank you so much. And I, I thought, oh, we are part of the Briones family uh, that live in Oregon. I had no idea there was a Briones family. Eight, how many? 13? 18 of them came. And they were just thrilled. Now, Paul Rio, as I know, a member of a family that he lives in Texas. So I called Paul. Paul, here's your long lost relative. And they're hugging and kissing. And so the Briocas family is scattered. Some come together. Some know one another. And they're discovering one another. And I would not be surprised somewhere, you know, people are going to say, you know, is if I'm connected to that Briones woman, and they'll do a genealogical search, and lo and behold, great, great, great grandniece or something. Right? 
So uh, but that, that's a fascinating part of, uh, of this process of historical discovery, because there are going to be some family members that uh, will say, gee, I, I might be a part of that expanded family. Mostly Bay Area, but not exclusively. So and also on the chance to explore, so sorry if this is in the exhibit, but after, I guess I'm curious, after defending the Presidio land and the, and the Yerba Buena land, what, what was the motivating factor to leave the city and like, who she sold to and kind of the story of, of kind of the decision to leave? Yeah, good question. You know, so did you guys hear that back there? So what, what, what do I think was the motivation for her to leave Yerba Buena in 1847? Now, she still held on to a lot up until 1857, I think it is. So she still had property here. And we believe that she actually, on probably many occasions, would make the two-day-long trek from Palo Alto back, because she knew people here at the Presidio. Um, but I wonder, that's a really good question. Here's where you have to speculate a little bit. What if she had waited two more years? the transformation of this area, right? Tran utter transformation of Yerba Buena, obliterated as the gold rush transforms that little Pueblo into the metropolis of the West. Um, she saw it. She had to come back to the Brasilio. She, I'm sure she at least had a view of what was going on through the 50s and 60s and probably into the 70s. And I would have loved to have heard her commentary on the transformation of San Francisco. So we don't have it, unfortunately. Uh, I think, going back to the heartier question, I think it was this. There were more and more people beginning to populate the, the cove. Land was becoming scarcer. And what does she do? There's an opportunity, probably through contacts at the mission, that this property in 1844, buys it in 1844, I think she leaves in 1847, she purchases those 4,400 acres in the hills of Palo Alto. Imagine that she kept on it, kept it to the day. <laughs> and what, what does she do? She starts over with much more land. And it has a, she has a going ranch and farm. And she hires a number of people, they're working the land, and she's making a go of it. But She's out there in the hinterlands, right? So it's very rural. And of course, Stanford University, well, not the university yet, but the Stanford's become a neighbor. Uh, but I don't think the Stanford's ever knew who, were, who their neighbors were to, to the north and the south. But a lot of speculation about that. But we can't answer it per se. Any other questions? Up here, there's the, oh wait, one back there and then up here. Yes, sir. Ma'am, I can't, I can't oh. see you back. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes, I can hear you. I, I have a question about your use of the term folk healer. Was her medical knowledge an inferior to what 19th century trained doctors were practicing? No, it wasn't trained medicine. And, and so, so curanderismo, curanderos and curanderas, we, we translate it as folk healers. These are people who over the course of probably 100, maybe 100 generations. So if you go back to indigenous cultures anywhere, there are always these folks that know what they're doing with herbs and other things to create medicines to heal. This goes way back before the Spanish come to the New World. The Spanish add some things, and over time, these curanderos become, in effect, the doctors on the frontiers. And they are, there are probably some bad food in there, wasn't some good food in there, but um, they knew how to work with herbs. And of course, we know medical science tells us today there are particular uh, herbs and other plants that have medicinal value. They obviously knew the medicinal value of particular plants and herbs passed on generation to generation to generation. Now, we speculate that perhaps she, she learned things from the Ohlone people that were in the mission area, right? Um, that are colonized by the Spanish. Because there was always this, this infusion of the indigenous 
with the colonizers, the colonized and the colonizers. And it, so it wasn't a static practice, it evolved. Um, but, you know, obviously she had developed a reputation um, early because we know that she learned from family members and then we also know that she taught family members. So she was carrying on the tradition of intergenerational knowledge about, about herbs and medicine. I've got, I can tell you, if, I, if you have another hour, I'd tell you about the curanderos that when I grew up in the barrio of Compton, uh, there was a curandera, and the story goes to me, I, long story, but short for you. Uh, doctors had given up on my brother, the next oldest brother. He, the mom took, mom and dad took him to children's hospitals, and I can't do anything for a man. She took him to Nalanina, the curandera, and she did some interesting things with him, and within a week he was cured. Well, how do you figure, right? <laughs> there, there was something about what this woman did with the herbs. It was olive oil. My mom talks about other kinds of things that she mixed together and put them on, had them sit on hot rock. It works. It works. And think how valued you are. So that's another thing. Think how valued and your esteem in the community when you can help people and you can cure people. So obviously, that was a huge part of her identity back then. Uh, see, there was... To sell piecemeal those portions that he, that he preserved. And he's waiting for hopefully the time when someone will come forward and say, I'll buy these from you and let's have a plan to resurrect this house. I may not be in my lifetime, but I would not doubt that the spirit of this house. It's going to go back up and you're going to see a water real structure someday intact. Yes, sir. Um, Santa Teresa de Caborca is a good example of Curandera. Yes, yeah, it's a real famous Curandera. came to this area. Also. Right. And, and if you, and so in the, in the history of the borderlands, the U.S. Mexican borderlands, there are, there are stories of these amazing healers, right? Some of whom we know, most of whom we don't, right? Because they were just, they were basically, basically just common folk. Um, that had a particular skill that was valued on the frontier. Um, it, the question I think that he was raising about uh, why she left this area, there, there was a lot of hatred generated towards Chilenos and uh, Mexicanos and people from Sonora. At, at the time of the gold rush, yes. Yeah, vigilantes in San Francisco. Absolutely, and absolutely. Sydney, things got pretty ugly. So that might have been a motivating factor to get out of this area to go to a larger area where it's calm. That's That would be my best guess is that she wanted more land, and it was gonna be away from the increase. So if you look at that particular period of time, more and more of the land is being subdivided, and more lots are being filled in. You know, she, we think she was, though she now is the, the first mother of San Francisco, we think, we're not absolutely sure, that she's either the second or third resident to actually to build a structure in the Arno Bueno. Um, but think about it, if that's the case in a big open area, that it's hard for us to imagine what it looks like now, but there's a couple, there's a couple artist renditions of it, so take a look at it. And it was still pretty empty, but it was filling in. So I suspect, going back to your question, that's one of the reasons that prompted her to go south to a beautiful track of land. There is, by the way, a wonderful photo of the, of the home at the time it sold around 1900 and sitting on the top of the hill and that's where you can get a sense of the uh, majestic view of the land and probably what you could see all around it. It was a beautiful homestead. I had two and a half million dollars, my wife and I would be living there now. <laughs> all right, are we through with questions? One more, is there yeah, one more question, sir, in the back and then we'll call it a night. So how did one get a start as a landlord? What was her first piece of property? Did she pay for it? Was she, what was it? So good, good question. How did she get her start as a landowner? Because yes, she had been over at the Presidio, right? Because that's where her, fa her father moved there as a soldier. And usually when soldiers retired, they were given grants of land. Her husband uh, was, was given a grant, a small plot of land right on the Presidio and a little portion right outside the Presidio boundaries, the one that she had to fight for all the way 
to the Supreme Court. But here's the interesting story. All right, an abusive husband. She is not, she knows she has to escape. She has to leave. She petitions the civil authorities. Mexican era, now you can petition for land. And you, make, you can make a claim that I'm going to sell this land, and I'll put a structure, and I'll be a good citizen. And she wins a claim to that land, and you ever win. Small plot of land around uh, Washington Square, up a little bit. You know, I don't know, I forget how many acres it is, but that she wins, not wins, she receives title to that land under Mexican land rights um, and then settles thereafter. Okay, folks, thank you so much for. Uh,